of the Arctic. Their voyage of discovery was to become one of the most enduring mysteries in the annals of exploration. Men had long dreamt of discovering a northwest passage, a fast sea route across the top of the world that would link Europe with Asia. For 300 years, ships had been setting out, ships of the Royal Navy, or ships of private merchants, had been setting out from England, intent on battering their way through uh, to get to the Pacific. And on the map, it looks so simple, because you have this giant archipelago north of Canada with nice little waterways. But of course, the reality is that those waterways are fixed, uh, often never ice-free, until Royal Navy captains got there. They didn't really have any idea of how distressingly difficult it was to find their way through this labyrinth of ice-choked passages. In that quest, you have the makings of a, of a search for the Holy Grail, because you just can't quite put your hand on it. You know it's there, but it's just beyond your grasp. And it's so close that that's what keeps the quest going. In 1845, the man behind the quest for a Northwest Passage was Sir John Barrow. He held the influential position of Second Secretary to the British Admiralty and had at his command the most powerful military force in the world. Barrow's influence is to be felt everywhere. You see that every ship that went, tried to get through the Northwest Passage or tried to get to the Pole, Barrow was involved with that somewhere. He was a man very much with his finger on the pulse of exploration. The Northwest Passage remained uh, his number one obsession. He had sponsored no fewer than eight expeditions in the previous 20 years to find it. Uh, in 1845, he was 82 years old. This was going to be his last chance uh, to uh, pocket the passage for the empire. He saw it as a means of uh, capping his career at the Admiralty, that the, the passage would have been nailed down finally under Barrow's tenancy on his watch, so to speak. Barrow's first choice to lead the expedition was James Clark Ross, the Navy's most experienced polar explorer. But he'd recently married and declined the offer. A less favored candidate was waiting in the wings. Sir John Franklin, a seasoned explorer, had mapped 2,000 miles of Arctic coastline early in his career. A close encounter with starvation had earned him public fame as the man who ate his boots. The one thing that everybody agrees on with Sir John Franklin is he was eminently likable because he was a, that rarity. He was a, a genuinely good man. He's resolutely British in the stereotypical way. But beneath that veneer is a very humane, warm man who would not put others in harm's way if he could help it. He was an immensely popular man. People liked him. They knew where they stood with him. He was, again, solid and reliable. And wherever people went, they always comment on Franklin as a man they could trust and follow. John Franklin was from Spilsby in Lincolnshire, where his father was a successful shopkeeper. One of three brothers, he was born in this tiny bedroom above his father's shop in 1786. He was later baptized in the local parish church. He grew up a devout Christian, and throughout his career, his actions were governed by strong evangelical principles. The young Franklin went to school a few miles away in Louth, where he received a solid education. It was in his boarding room at the top of the headmaster's house that he dreamed of a life at sea. At the age of 15, he entered the Royal Navy and quietly carved a name for himself as a young officer, seeing active service at the Battle of Trafalgar and the Battle of New Orleans. His reputation was firmly established with two epic overland expeditions to the Arctic on behalf of the Admiralty, when he mapped a great part of the North American coastline. They brought him public acclaim and a knighthood. He'd been a most successful, not just a, a naval commander, but a successful explorer on behalf of the Admiralty. So, of course, when the chance came to lead what was thought of as the final expedition to discover a Northwest Passage, John Franklin 
put himself forward and was quite sure that nobody else should have a chance. His career, however, had been in the doldrums. An appointment to Tasmania as governor for seven years had not been a success, and Franklin longed to re-establish the glory of his polar years. When asked by the Admiralty for his views on a final attempt to find a northwest passage, he naturally gave the idea a ringing endorsement. Your Lordship's most obedient servant, John Franklin, Captain Royal Navy. In his ambition to lead the expedition, Franklin was strongly supported by his second wife, Jane, a woman of character and determination with a passion for world travel. She lobbied fiercely on her husband's behalf and knew that despite his recent career setbacks, he was still one of Britain's leading Arctic explorers. Sir John Barrow needed a, a name with marquee value, as impresarios would say. And Franklin certainly had that. He was, uh, he'd been knighted, uh, he was famous, he was a household word. Uh, he hadn't been to the Arctic in 20 years, and Sir John Barrow pointedly had not given him an important assignment in almost 20 years, but he had the name value. And so, at the age of 59, Captain Sir John Franklin is given command of HMS Erebus and Terror to find and sail through the Northwest Passage. Erebus and Terra were identical vessels which had recently seen service in the Antarctic. Both were sailing ships with strengthened hulls, and for the journey to the Arctic were specially fitted with locomotive engines to help power them through the ice. HMS Erebus and HMS Terra were literally the space shuttles of their day, built and equipped to go where no ships had gone before. Two ships carefully outfitted, not just with bluff bows and sturdy hulls, but armored as well and equipped with steam engines, the epitome of technology to force their way through the ice. They were uh, driven by screw propellers instead of uh, side paddle wheels, which was the norm at the time. And even more advanced, these propellers were retractable. They pack everything possible that they can think of, books, costumes for theatrical plays, a monkey and a dog to help amuse them, musical instruments, canned and tinned foods, the best that modern technology can offer to help keep them from spoiling, and all of the tools that they might need to saw and chip their way out of the ice. The ships were provisioned for at least three years, and with 134 men on board, nothing was left to chance. As Erebus and Terra were prepared for departure, Franklin received his final orders from the Admiralty. The object of the voyage, Sir John, is the discovery of a Northwest Passage. The supreme command of the expedition is vested in you, and you will proceed in the Erebus as soon as the preparations are complete. By mid-May 1845, the two ships were fully provisioned and ready for departure. At home, Lady Franklin was putting the finishing touches to a silk flag she had made. It was to be placed at the point where her husband would successfully breach the Northwest Passage. Oh, my dear, I beg of you, never do that. That's how they treat a corpse in Her Majesty's Navy. Oh, John. I'm so sorry. Despite this unfortunate incident, Franklin and his men left England on May the 19th, 1845, in high spirits. They sailed up the coast of Britain and after a brief stop in the Orkneys, headed for their first Arctic port of call, on the west coast of Greenland. Erebus and Terra could boast some of the finest officers in Her Majesty's Navy. Second in command to Franklin and captain of the Terra was Francis Crozier. He'd recently returned from a four-year period in the Antarctic with James Clark Ross. Captain of the Erebus and third in command of the expedition was the dashing James Fitz James, one of the most popular men in the Navy. The journal he kept on their voyage to Greenland provides a unique insight into the atmosphere on board Erebus and the characters of some of his fellow officers. I have just had a game of chess with the purser Ozma, who is delightful. Full of quaint dry sayings, always good humoured, always laughing, never a bore. And he is a gentleman, the most original character of all. Rough, intelligent, unpolished, with a broad North Country accent, but not vulgar, good-humoured and honest-hearted. 
is Reed, a Greenland whaler, native of Aberdeen. Graham Gore, the first lieutenant, is a man of great stability of character, a very good officer, and the sweetest of tempers. And everybody is in a good humor, either with himself or his neighbors. On board Terror, a different spirit prevailed. Captain Crozier had the most Arctic experience of all the officers on the expedition. In a letter to his closest friend, the explorer James Clark Ross, he revealed his misgivings. James, I wish you were here. I would then have no doubt of our pursuing a proper course. How I do miss you. I cannot bear going on board the Erebus. Sir John is very kind and would have me there every day if I would go. All things are going on well and quietly, but we are, I fear, sadly late. What I fear is that, from our being so late, we shall have no time to look around and judge for ourselves, but blunder into the ice and make an 1824 of it. All goes smoothly, but I am sadly alone. The crews of Erebus and Terra had no such misgivings. Most of them had not been to the Arctic before, and for them it was a great adventure. The generous discovery pay was also a strong incentive for facing the challenges that lay ahead. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us... Their faith in Franklin, their commander and spiritual leader was absolute. He not his own son, but delivered him up for all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Franklin conducted his own religious services and that was very much part of the tone of the expedition, this feeling of faith which bound people together. As it is written, for thy sake we are all killed There was all the this day long. concentration on the Christian moment, if you like, every moment of the day would have been considered in terms of how Sir John was looking after his own soul, and by extension, the souls of the officers and men who went with him. With his gallant seaman he sailed away To the frozen oceans in the month of May To seek the passage around the pole, where England sailors do sometimes go. It took them almost a month to reach the west coast of Greenland. With its spectacular ice formations, it gave them their first taste of the Arctic. The men were spellbound and found their first safe anchorage at Disco Bay. There they replenished their supplies and sent journals and letters back to England, along with five crewmen invalided home. Morale on the two ships remained good. Captain Fitzjames made a final entry in his journal before the expedition left Greenland for the heart of the Arctic. Sir John is full of life and energy, with good judgment and a capital memory. One of the best I know. His conversation is delightful and most instructive. And of all men, he is the most fitted for the command on an enterprise requiring sound sense and great perseverance. Gentlemen, as we embark upon this noble venture, may I propose, Sir John, a toast to your dear wife, Lady Franklin, and daughter, Miss Eleanor. Lady Franklin and Miss Eleanor. Their northwest journey from Disco Bay to the heart of the Arctic lay across Baffin Bay and then west down Lancaster Sound. On July the 12th, 1845, they left. It took them just less than a month to sail across the ice-dotted waters of Baffin Bay. 
The ships were last seen by two Arctic whalers at the end of July, and they reported that Franklin and his men were all well and in remarkable spirits. Their progress was phenomenal, as was later determined. The temperatures and ice that summer were among the mildest ever recorded in the Arctic. They raced 900 miles west down Lancaster Sound, propelled by favorable winds and their revolutionary steam engines. However, this remarkable progress was too good to last. The two vessels were eventually prevented from sailing further west or north by the heavy ice. After circumnavigating Cornwallis Island, the ships found a safe haven for the winter in the lee of Beachy Island, just as the sea began to freeze over. Franklin's men came ashore on this beach. More than 150 years later, it still bears the evidence of their presence. These mounds mark the site of their winter headquarters, where they could escape from the confines of the two ships. There were cooking and washing areas, a shooting range, a forge, and even a kitchen garden. They were fully prepared for the Arctic winter. The British had the system of, of winter quarters down to a, a science by 1845. The top masts were struck down. Snow was shoveled up against the sides of the ship to insulate it from the cold. Temperatures at 50 below zero sometimes. Blizzards and total whiteout conditions of others. So it was a very lonely and dark place. And for most of the men, this was their first experience of an Arctic winter. And uh, it was, to say the least, uh, uh, a sobering, psychologically trying experience. Everything inside the ship frosted. Uh, a bolt coming through the side of the ship would have a, a knot of frost on the end of it because the cold was coming through. And then the frost would melt. If you got the, the interior of the ship warm enough, the hoarfrost would melt and drip down on the occupants. You had to keep the men busy and exercised and interested in life. And so they had plays, they had classes, they taught the Blue Jackets uh, how to read. Many of them couldn't. The senior officers would have spent much of the winter committing their detailed scientific observations and magnetic readings to paper. When the weather permitted, they would have led small sledge parties to map and explore the surrounding area. Any opportunity to hunt fresh meat would have been seized upon. As soon as spring appeared and the ships were freed from the ice, the men left. The expedition left Beachy Island in a real rush and contrary to usual practice in the Royal Navy, didn't leave any written documents about how their winter had been passed, didn't leave the logs and journals that they normally would have perhaps left at a place like that. It's very strange that there, was, there wasn't a record left at Beachy Island, uh, and in fact there may have been one there, it just wasn't found, because he certainly did leave an enormous cairn. And they also left these three headstones. Not all the crew could withstand the rigours of that first winter. Torrington, Hartnell and Brain were all buried here. The expedition carried on, sailing down a mysterious seaway that had opened to the south. They'd had an overwinter on Beachy Island. Then suddenly, almost unexpectedly, a passageway was opened to the south, down Peel Sound. No one had ever seen this open before. None of the earlier expeditions had ever seen it. So they took the opportunity and dashed down Peel Sound. Franklin's men must have been jubilant. They were in uncharted waters, but seemed to have discovered a seaway that would bridge the remaining gap in the Northwest Passage. Steady as she goes. It's going directly in the direction he was ordered to, to take, and um, not unnaturally, he uh, 
he plunges down it and he makes tremendous progress. And what he didn't realize was that Peel Sound is sort of like a, a pitcher plant that admits an insect and then closes behind him. Unprecedented progress down Peel Sound, helped by their revolutionary steam engines. With the ship's boilers stoked to capacity and a full head of sail, they rapidly covered 200 miles. The expedition's ice masters successfully piloted the ships through the unknown waters and the broken ice. Franklin was at last living his dream. It seemed nothing could stop their headlong progress south and the completion of a northwest passage. As they were coming down Peel Sound, which was the sort of entry into that final unknown link of the Northwest Passage, they came to King William Land, and there was a fork in the road. And they could either go right or they could go left. And they chose to go right because it was a broader entry. But what they didn't realize is they're getting into the worst possible position for ice coming out of Victoria Strait. Subsequently, they could have found, other explorers found, you could go around King William Island. It wasn't a land, but they turned right which seemed the right way to go. The first indications of the dangers that lay ahead would have come from the lookouts. Hummocky flows off the port bow, hundreds of them. Hummocky flows were chunks of old sea ice with brown tide marks on their sides. To the experienced eyes of Crozier and the ship's ice masters, it would have meant only one thing, heavy ice lay ahead. That ice is not just ordinary ice. It actually comes thundering down McClintock Strait, hits the northwest corner of King William Island, piles up. You get these huge pressure ridges, you get this great massive thick ice, and that's where he found his ships. Franklin found his ships in that ice. The ice grew thicker and thicker around Erebus and Terra. Gone were the open leas through which they could negotiate the ships. The point they had reached in Victoria Strait was little more than 100 miles from the North American mainland and completing the link with the rest of the passage. Suddenly, just off the northwest coast of King William Island, they could go no further. They were 25 miles off the coast, uh, out of sight of land, actually, and there was nothing around them but, uh, but pack ice, just a wilderness of white, empty pack ice. There was no going forward, there was no going back. All they could do was go into winter quarters and uh, hope the following year would, uh, would release them. Unlike their previous winter quarters at Beachy, this was no safe haven. Both ships were in a perilous situation, trapped in the heaving pack ice, which threatened to crush them at any moment. Life below deck was grim. Explorers have gone to great lengths describing the noise the ice makes, the whimpering of puppies, express trains, thunder, yowling, screaming. I mean, they say the range of noises is extraordinary. And you can imagine that men who are new to it would be terrified. You multiply that by the gale force winds that at times actually shook the ship, and you've got a, a very eerie alien world 12 inches from your head which is always reminding you that death is lurking very, very close. Remarkably, both ships and all the men survived the terrible winter of 1846. With the coming of spring, the ships remained imprisoned in the ice. Franklin hoped that in the brief weeks of the coming summer, the ice around his ships would melt and they would be free to continue their triumphal journey south. Oh, hear us when we try to... In May 1847, Franklin ordered a sledge party ashore from the beset ships to explore King William Island and leave a message. Sledge party going ashore, a prayer. O Lord of life and death, have mercy upon those that are appointed to die. Amen. Amen.
Led by Lieutenant Graham Gore, one of the senior officers, the eight-man sledge party was sent out across the ice to the northwest coast of King William Island, 23 miles away. It was no easy task and took them five days. The Inuit called the northwest coast, particularly the back of beyond, which seems to me very descriptive. It's a broken limestone, very low-lying, very desolate. You get um, sea ice fog rolling off. It's very windy, almost continually windy and cold, and uh, the vistas go on forever. It uh, is psychologically difficult, as well as being physically difficult. You really feel that you're isolated. Gore and his sledge party made their way to Victory Point on the northwest coast of the island, a place visited some years before by a fellow explorer, James Clark Ross. In a stone cairn they believed he had built, they placed this metal canister, containing a message dated May the 28th, 1847. It told of the expedition's progress to date and concluded with the words, all well. If everybody's alive and the expectation is that the spring thaw will free the ships, They'll complete the last portion of the passage and uh, be on their way to uh, Bering Strait in the Pacific. Meanwhile, back in London at the Admiralty, the expedition's instigator, Sir John Barrow, had finally retired. But amongst his successors, there was no undue concern for the expedition's welfare. It was not unusual for Arctic explorers to be out of touch for a long time. You have to remember that especially on exploratory expeditions of the 18th and 19th century. Being out of contact for four years was not really that dramatic. Uh, six years was probably even not that dramatic, especially when you're going through areas where there are no British consuls and there are no towns to check in and send your mail back. So actually, I don't think that the, they were being unnecessarily uh, blasé. But one person who had a premonition about the expedition's safety was Franklin's wife, Jane. From her father's home in London, she embarked upon a letter-writing campaign, urging that a search be made for her husband's expedition. She lobbied the Admiralty mercilessly. She was really bothering everybody she could so that they would send expeditions. Of course, we know that she was friends with most of the polar people in the Admiralty. They were friends of her family, friends of Sir John Franklin, and uh, they could, in fact, have a very strong effect. The Admiralty, bowing to this pressure and amidst their own mounting concerns, called upon the Arctic Council, a group of senior polar experts, to organize a search for Franklin. James Clark Ross, Britain's most experienced Arctic explorer and Crozier's closest friend, was a council member and was the first to set out to look for John Franklin. But it would be to no avail. Franklin was already dead. Within two weeks of the all well message being left in the cairn at Victory Point on May the 28th, 1847, Franklin had died, and Crozier had become the expedition's leader. Franklin's ships were to remain locked in the ice off King William Island for another winter. And in that time, a further 20 men were to die, 12 crew and 8 officers. By the spring of 1848, the men had been away for three years. It was unlikely that they would have had the resources to survive yet another year locked in the pack ice. And yet, there was still no sign of the ice releasing its stranglehold on their ships. Crozier, as the expedition's leader, made the agonizing decision to abandon the beset ships on April the 22nd, 1848. His plan was to lead the remaining 104 men to what he thought would be their salvation. For four grueling days, they dragged their possessions across the ice, on ship's boats mounted on sledges, to King William Island. Crozier and his men came ashore in this bay. 
It became a gigantic marshalling yard where supplies from the ships were deposited. The all well message that had been deposited in the cairn 11 months earlier by Gore was recovered and amended. In Fitzjames' hand along its margins was recorded Franklin's death on the 11th of June 1847, the deaths of the other 23 men and the abandonment of the beset ships. No reasons were given for their deaths. Scribbled in the corner in Crozier's handwriting were the words and start on tomorrow the 26th for Baxfish River. This cryptic postscript poses one of the greatest mysteries of the whole Franklin saga. For the Bax River was 200 miles away to the south on the North American mainland and help from a Hudson's Bay Company outpost lay another 800 miles beyond that. The most sensible thing to do would have been to have headed north to have somehow sledged across the ice back up Peel Sound then they would have known that search expeditions were coming through Lancaster Sound looking for them and even if search expeditions hadn't been following them they could have had uh, some chance of getting back to their own winter quarters on Beachy Island where they left huge amounts of food and fuel. So the sensible thing would have been to have headed north and people have often wondered why did Crozier head south? He would have been very keen to have completed Sir John Franklin's mission. The country was expecting them to discover the Northwest Passage. And it, there was so little left to do just to get down to the north coast of America where they'd be on previously explored grounds. I believe they were heading to the most hospitable hunting area that they knew was within striking distance. I think that their direction was absolutely correct. They were headed for the nearest area where they had a fairly high expectation of being able to reprovision with fresh food and also because it was such a good hunting area, they had a very high expectation that they would meet uh, large and organized bands of Inuit there who might be able to direct them or send messages out or help them on their retreat. Even if the remaining crew members had been rescued in April 1848, the expedition would have already broken all records for deaths in marine exploration. Why then, even before the final desperate march to the mainland, were Franklin's losses so heavy? And why did a disproportionate number of officers die early on? Several theories have been put forward. In the mid-1980s, Canadian researchers exhumed the three frozen bodies buried at Beachy to carry out post-mortems on them. All three bodies contained an unusually high concentration of lead. Perhaps the lead solder used in sealing the cans contaminated the contents and poisoned the men. That theory gained wide currency, but not everyone believes it. There's nothing unusual about finding lead in bones. Apart from that, um, lead which is ingested uh, is 90% excreted, but of what is retained, about half of it goes into the bones anyway. The bones act as a sink, and uh, once it goes into the bone, it is, it is to a very large extent immobilised. Um, but it would it, it is entirely to be expected that anybody living at that particular time would have shown uh, high lead levels in the bones. Lead poisoning is a, is a progressive uh, and slow-moving, debilitating disease, uh, not one that would kill uh, nine officers and 12 men in that 10-month period before the ships were abandoned. Even if lead had got into the cans, Dr. Farrer believes it would not have contaminated the contents. The lead would have been chemically attracted to the tin and iron of the can, and not the food. The electrochemical properties of a can of meat or a can of soup at that comparatively low acidity are such that the tin and the iron of the can protect the lead from solution so that the lead does not get into the food in sufficient concentration. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the quantities of canned food which were being carried by Franklin were simply not big enough to have raised the blood lead level to a concentration such that lead poisoning would eventuate. Those men may or may not have been suffering from lead poisoning. I don't know, but what I do know is that if they were, it was not due to the canned food. The same canned food supplied by the expedition's victualler, Stefan Goldner, has become the subject of further controversy. 
In the rush to deliver them, Scott Cookman believes they weren't cooked to a sufficiently high temperature, and as a result, the contents were contaminated with botulism spores. Looking at the kinds of food that were canned, looking at the time frame involved, looking at the, uh, the fact that larger tins were substituted for, uh, for smaller ones, uh, particularly with the types of foods uh, that were being handled. Uh, the circumstantial evidence is extremely high that they were uh, uh, contaminated almost certainly with uh, uh, several sorts of foodborne disease. But the odds for botulism contamination are extremely high, I believe. But again, Dr. Farah, a leading authority on 19th century canning techniques, disagrees with this theory. If the cans had deteriorated, in a word, had gone off, there would have been swelling because of gas production. And in addition, there would normally have been um, an unpleasant smell when the can was finally opened. Um, this, for an under-processed can, would have been pretty evident. The most likely cause for the high mortality rate would have been scurvy, a pernicious disease caused by lack of vitamin C and common amongst sailors. Lacking fresh meat and vegetables for long periods, Arctic expeditions were particularly prone to it. A third winter in the ice would have made Franklin's men easy targets. The body needs vitamin C in order that its connective tissues can function properly. And the connective tissues are what have been called the packaging material of the body, in that they surround, separate, protect the bodily organs and the joints. By about six or seven months, of vitamin C deprivation, you get the classic symptom, the swollen, bloody gums, uh, the loose teeth beginning to appear in the mouth is, is first observed. And after that, really it's a slow process of degeneration towards death. By nine months, um, it's been shown in experimental studies that cardiac hemorrhage begins to occur, and that, of course, is a fatal conclusion. Ever since Franklin's men succumbed in the Central Arctic, people have been looking for one golden bullet, one reason that they died. I don't really subscribe to the single cause theory. I believe that essentially they ended up in a very inhospitable place, as far from help as they could get, and that they were in a no-win situation. I think that uh, given the same physical constraints, a modern party would come to the same unfortunate result. For those who had not yet succumbed to the rigors of surviving in the Arctic for three years, the Great March South began on the 26th of April, 1848. 105 men hauled the ship's boats placed on sledges, containing everything they felt they needed for their journey. Here you are, so far away from home, isolated from all you know, isolated from life as you know it, in what is seemingly an inhospitable, sterile desert. You've been trapped by ice, it's been incredibly dark, the wind never lets up. And now you have to walk across a landscape of cold, ice, snow, and ice-fractured rock that twists your ankles and tears out and gnaws away at your leather boots. The Royal Navy tradition, uh, that strong tradition, would have manifested itself again. And that, that, that uh, strong definition of duty that everyone had, rallying themselves for this last Herculean effort. Perhaps uh, only very few of them actually realized the geography that they were facing and how the distances. And if, uh, certainly if I was one of the commanding officers, I would not have played up the fact that uh, it was a thousand miles to help. I can speculate that they were still very much up to it and were looking forward to making their way to the Great Fish River, Bax River, and to uh, salvation at a Hudson's Bay Company post. The men were ill-equipped for such a huge undertaking. No one had ever thought for a moment that so many men would have to brave the ice and extremes of the Arctic. Even today, with technology and proper clothing and equipment, it's an unforgiving region. They would have had completely incorrect clothes for man-hauling sledge boats. They would have sweated very badly, and that would caused them to have hardly any insulation left in whatever clothes they did have, and they would have ended up being very prone to hypothermia. If your feet aren't dry and they're sweaty or, or you fall into the water, um, you're going to get frostbite. And I know for a fact that leather boots, which they had, in those very low temperatures, are just like pieces of iron. 
and in the mornings they would have to virtually use a hammer to get the um, boots onto their feet. I had uh, frostbitten uh, fingers about five months ago and after about four months um, the, the, the ends of the fingers, the, which of course are missing from, from these fingers, um, it just became leathery talons on the end. Um, and where the, the live flesh met the dead flesh, uh, the air wasn't g getting in. So in fact, about 10 days ago, I took a saw to the ends. Um, I've got the ends of the fingers in the drawer over there um, and cut them off just down to a level which allowed the air to get in. So auto amputation is probably what they would have done or possibly cut off each other's frozen digits. And we're talking about a lot of people with a lot of frostbitten digits. As Crozier's men trudged south along the shoreline of King William Island, pulling their heavy sledge boats, what were their chances of survival? In addition to the Arctic under James Clark Ross to search for Sir John Franklin had returned empty-handed. Franklin had disappeared into an uncharted void, and there was no agreement amongst the experts as to where he might be. The search for Franklin was one of the biggest organized manhunts in history. The Admiralty offered a series of prizes. It was £20,000 for finding Franklin himself, £10,000 for finding his ships. In one season, there were no less than 13 ships swarming all over the Arctic trying to find Franklin. There were numerous eager volunteers for the dangerous enterprise. One extraordinary expedition, led by Captain Robert McClure, scoured the Arctic for three and a half years. They too were finally forced to abandon their icebound ship, but were rescued before they suffered a fate similar to Franklin's men. Rescue parties used every means within their power to find Franklin. With their ships and sledge teams, they scoured thousands of square miles of the Arctic, and in doing so, showed great ingenuity. Balloons were launched with messages for the lost expedition, telling them where the rescue ships were. They even attached collars to Arctic foxes, bearing similar messages for the missing men. They left bundles of food and supplies at various locations. Here at Beachy, they erected a purpose-built storehouse. Some of the contents have survived to this day. Lady Franklin left no stone unturned in her campaign to find the missing men. She even wrote to the President of the United States, Zachary Taylor. The name of my husband, Sir John Franklin, is probably not unknown to you. He is intimately connected with the northern part of that continent. To accomplish the objects you have in view, the attention of American navigators and especially of our whalers will be immediately invoked. She went even further. In 1850, she started financing her own expeditions to search for her husband and his men, independently of those being sent out by the Royal Navy. When she started raising her own money to send her own expeditions, she, she threw down a kind of gauntlet. They couldn't be seen to be doing less for a, a serving British naval officer um, than his wife was. In 1854, the first concrete news of the expedition's fate was brought to England, not by a Royal Navy search ship, but by Dr. John Ray of the Hudson's Bay Company. Here we have a man who happens to come across a group of Netsalik Eskimos who had a number of Franklin-related items. Uh, almost chillingly, they had the, the neck badge of Sir John Franklin, of his Guelphic order. They also related stories they had heard of cannibalism among some of the Franklin survivors. A suggestion of cannibalism brought back to England by Dr. John Ray of the Hudson's Bay Company were very unpalatable indeed to the Victorian society who could never think that gallant men of the Royal Navy and gallant British subjects could ever descend to such thing. If cannibalism had happened on the expedition, then there had been a kind of moral collapse which, which contradicted everything that had been said about polar exploration as a, as a noble, virtuous, moral calling. It, it would have gone right against the way that people understood what it meant when British explorers went to the Arctic. 
It was not until the 20th century that these apocryphal stories gained some credibility. In 1993, a large collection of bones, unearthed at Erebus Bay on King William Island, were forensically examined by anthropologist Anne Keenlyside. It was only when I got back to the lab and began my detailed investigation of these skeletal remains that I realized the extent of these cut marks, the fact that they affected a quarter of the bones recovered, the sheer number of the cut marks and the distribution. And it became clear to me at that time that cannibalism was the only explanation for these cut marks. They think, oh, well, OK, here's cut marks on bones. Cut marks must mean cannibalism. I don't do that at all. I say cut marks much more likely to mean an attack. Here we've got 105 men coming down that coast amongst people who are living absolutely on the edge of survival. So he was a huge threat to them, to their survival. Apart from the face, the hands and feet are the most recognizably human parts of the body. In situations of cannibalism, they're normally consumed last. The fact that we're seeing cut marks on the bones of the hands and feet indicates the desperate situation in which these men found themselves. The large number of cut marks, as they're called, are on the hands. Now, you don't have to be a police pathologist to realize that that's someone defending themselves, those cut marks. I find the evidence completely uncompelling on cannibalism, but very compelling on an attack. As these dark tales, first conveyed by Dr. John Ray, filtered back to England, there was increasing frustration amongst the polar experts at the Admiralty. Their extensive searches had uncovered the sad evidence of Franklin's first winter at Beachy, but nothing more. Early search parties had gazed down Peel Sound, saw solid ice, and fatally concluded that Franklin could not have sailed down there. This conclusion had coloured all their subsequent areas of search. They looked for Franklin in every part of the Arctic, except the right one. In 1854, they declared the expedition members officially lost, thereby suspending all further searches. This announcement enraged Lady Franklin and spurred her on to organise a fourth and final expedition of her own. To be indecorous, not to say indecent. Lady Jane continued on her own hook, uh, antagonising members of her family by scraping and borrowing and scrimping and finding people who would get her money to hire ships. And the last ship she sent was a little uh, yacht, really, called the Fox. And she was fortunate enough in that the captain for that expedition would be Leopold McClintock. Leopold McClintock, an experienced Royal Navy captain, was highly skilled in overland travel. Using dogs and man-hauled sledges, he covered huge tracts of King William Island in his search for the missing party. His team were finally rewarded. They discovered the cairn at Crozier's Landing, and within it, the message left by the 105 survivors before they'd headed south. Along these desolate shores, McClintock's sledge party found no ships, but plenty of tragic evidence of Crozier's desperate march south with his remaining men. With his gallant seamen, he sailed away. It was from these sad objects and skeletal remains that the final days of the expedition were pieced together. McClintock's most poignant discovery was made at Erebus Bay, 50 miles south from where the march had begun. It was one of the ship's boats containing two skeletons. One of them was clutching a rifle. Because McClintock was only 11 years after the event, these were still fairly well-preserved remains. The boat was in good shape, uh, carpet slippers and throw rugs and books and uh, other material was still in very good shape. So it forms a, a little vignette of uh, the march uh, that these men were left behind by their compatriots 
and uh, lived out their last few minutes uh, with one strong one with a rifle protecting the other one and uh, eventually succumbed. The other thing he found was a skeleton lying on his face and essentially with no companions around him. It strongly indicates that he was a straggler who uh, just fell behind the main party and uh, sat down on a rock and then fainted onto the beach. Uh, very solitary, depressing end to this person's life. In England, Lady Franklin as yet knew nothing of McClintock's tragic findings. She clung to the hope that by some miracle, her husband or a member of his party might still be found alive. It was her final expedition that succeeded, where 40 others had failed. In London, Lady Franklin anxiously awaited news from her search party. In late September 1859, she received a letter from its leader, Captain McClintock. That they were beset in September 1846 off the northwest coast of King William Island. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June 1847. Franklin, it turned out, had died in 1847. This was both early enough and late enough. Early enough in the sense that he was dead long before the expedition resorted to cannibalism or didn't. So he was free of it either way. Late enough because he had died at a point in the Northwest Passage which could, by a stretch of the imagination, be claimed as its centre point. And Lady Jane devoted her energies then to his geographical vindication. She made him into the discoverer of the Northwest Passage by changing the meaning of those words. Suddenly, discovery could be something you did without getting home alive, without even sending the news to civilization. If you froze in halfway through the Northwest Passage, so that the map of the eastern section of it could now be joined to the map of the western section of it. That was enough. Lady Franklin confirmed his reputation as the discoverer of the Northwest Passage with the unveiling of this statue in the heart of London in 1866, paid for by Parliament. In her relentless quest to establish the expedition's fate, she had become as famous as her late husband, she became what might be called the Polar Queen. She was the goddess of search, and she represented somebody who was never giving up, who would go on searching and searching and searching. She represented every man's ideal of the fidelity they would like from their wife if they were lost. And when women looked at her, they saw an embodiment of every grief, every anxiety they had about their menfolk, their brothers, husbands, sons, whenever they were away doing something dangerous in the greater world. Lady Franklin outlived her late husband by almost 30 years. When she died in 1875, she was laid to rest in this catacomb, with a space next to her reserved for Sir John. Until her dying day, Lady Franklin spearheaded the search for the lost expedition. She found an unlikely ally in Charles Francis Hall, a small newspaper proprietor from Cincinnati. He was so obsessed with Franklin, he decided he would chuck everything and go and try and find, not necessarily relics, he had fixated in his mind that there were still people living. And he was determined that he, Charles Francis Hall, was going to be the man to bring back one of the explorers himself. He was probably the first white man to really submit to the Eskimo way of life. Um, he ate their food, he traveled with them, uh, he wore their clothes, and in, he learned how to adapt to their way of life. 
It took Hall almost 10 years to reach the barren shores of King William Island because he was subject to the Eskimos' nomadic life and their hunt for food rarely took them there. When he finally gets to King William Island, what he finds is a skeleton. It was brought to England and they discovered it was the remains of Lieutenant Le Bescant of the Arabas. They were able to identify it because of a plugged tooth. He devoted 10 years of his life uh, deeply believing somehow that there had to be Franklin survivors. He really should have known better. But Hall's quest was not in vain. His journals contain many Inuit stories that seem to relate to the fatal march. But there have been problems in understanding the Inuit oral tradition. The reason why they get confused about uh, explorers is they don't know the, the, um, the name of the explorer or the, or the difference from the white people they've seen, like they were all the same. There is also a problem of chronology. When stories are passed down, that's how they get mixed up because nobody really could say this thing happened 10 years ago or 15 years ago. If they try to talk about six years or five years back, they don't have any word for it. Despite these problems of interpretation, the Inuit stories suggest that Franklin's men did not march south in one organized group to die with the onset of winter in 1848 within sight of the North American mainland. They indicate a much more complex scenario. I started off with my research with the same opinion as most that the Inuit stories would not be very useful, that they would be garbled and, and impossible to corroborate and was amazed over the years of reading them how consistent they actually are. I believe that the initial 1848 abandonment quickly came to naught, that uh, they realized that 105 men with a one-month window were not going to make it uh, off King William Island, and that they fell back on their only real alternative, which was to return to the ships. Then I believe the ships were both freed enough in 1849 by the ice to either sail or drift south into Erebus Bay, and that is where the Inuit first interacted with Franklin's crews. In fact, they are very consistent in their tales that that is where the ships came to their land. I think that 1850 was the time of the massive push to get out and that that was the disastrous push when most of the men met their doom, but that some of them even survived that. Louis Kamukar travelled across the sea ice to the Todd Islands, one of the furthest points south reached by the survivors. His research suggests many more Franklin men made it this far south than had previously been thought. I always believe Todd Island is one of the last point where they left King William Island trying to get across the mainland and I believe that um, from Victory Point to Todd Island they covered about 200 miles you know dragging dragging their boats from the evidence I see each time I go there and it, it's uh, it's not where some people just stopped there and died like they spend days there like there was a camp, a big camp there. I think there was you know, maybe over 40 people, maybe 50 people in Todd Island at one time. So it's possible that almost half the men who set out from Victory Point made it this far. An incredible feat. Kamukar based his conclusions on the number of skeletal remains that he found there. The top part of a human skull. And, um, I think it's it's one of Franklin's men, like it's related to Franklin's men. So part of the skull is broken, but just the top part. As we were growing up, like we were all just told by the older people, our parents and grandparents, if you're going to travel on King William Island, you don't travel alone. You travel with someone else because you know it's there's a lot of spirit out there, like the Englishmen all died up, died on the island. And that's one of the, you know, biggest reasons, like, that people respect um, these people that died off on the island, that suffered. They, they want to get back to their country, but they all died off. And the people today respect um, they're, like they're, they're suffering. There was not a single survivor. 
It seems a handful crossed from the Todd Islands to the North American mainland, only to perish at Starvation Cove. The expedition that had sailed from England with such confidence and hope had become one of the biggest catastrophes in the history of exploration. Who was to blame? The grand Arctic expedition that sailed away to forge the last link in the Northwest Passage had ended in tragedy. There was a lot of hubris attached to it. They thought they'd explored so much of the Northwest Passage that there was only a little bit left and therefore any technique would do, you could get through whatever you tried. So let's do it with big ships and a Royal Naval group because then there'd be lots of glory for Britain in this. Franklin got further into that Northwest Passage than anybody else and he ran into that plug west side of King William Island which is still there each and every year in these days. He ran into Mother Nature. It was not bungling in my mind. It was not bungling on the part of the seamen, the officers, or the British Navy. No. They went to the very center of the Canadian Arctic, where they were absolutely beyond the pale of help from Europe. They went just far enough to be almost to their goal, which tended to make them persist rather than give up. They were only 60 miles from discovering that last link in the Northwest Passage that they'd been sent to find. And that basically they were in a no-win situation. One of the greatest ironies of it all is that John Franklin is greater in death than he was in life. We certainly know the name Roald Amundsen and the tiny little sloop yaw, the first to sail through the Northwest Passage. But does Amundsen have the same draw? Does the name have the same recognition as Franklin? No. It's because Franklin died spectacularly. And in his death inspired a search and a quest which burned in the hearts of the world. The search for Franklin ensured British sovereignty over the Arctic. When British North America became Canada, that sovereignty passed to the new nation. Strangely enough, the Franklin disaster turned out to be the main agent, in a way, in the expansion of Canada as a, to what it is today, one of the largest countries in the world with the longest shoreline. A portion of the Arctic was mapped before some portion of central Canada with this expedition. So this is the irony of it. Franklin failed, but he succeeded through his failure in doing a lot for Canada. But it's the scale of the tragedy and the unanswered questions that continue to provoke scholars today. You have two real things that are the holy grail of the Franklin search. The first will be the logs. I, I'm convinced, as are most, that during the long winters, the officers were employed in making duplicate logs, which was normal practice and that once it became apparent that they were going to make a desperate attempt for safety, that those logs would have been taken ashore and buried or secured in an uh, appropriate place for later discovery. There would have been the ship's logs for both ships, the master books for both ships, the surgeon's journals for both ships, all the junior officers' journals, and a, a tremendous amount of, of scientific records, particularly those of the magnetic observations. They would either have been left in the ships or possibly buried somewhere in King William Island. The next piece of evidence would be either of the two wrecks. If we find either wreck, it may give us clues as to the final days, especially if the story did extend for a few years, it may confirm or perhaps uh, negate the theory that the expedition extended beyond 1848. The location of uh, ships like the Erebus and Terror will obviously someday be known. Uh, mankind has been searching for them for 150 years and more and uh, with the, today's technology just a matter of time and some time of luck to locate them and identify them. I believe also they are already located. Uh, I hear of some accounts that uh, there's some targets detected by sonar from the Coast Guard and so on. Not proven, not truly identified. So it's only a matter of time. Finding is, in my view, within reach pretty soon. For me, the grail, without any doubt, is to find the burial place of Sir John Franklin. 
And of course the ships are important, and of course any, anything we can find is important. But to find Sir John Franklin really would sort of make it full circle. There were three possible things they could have done with his body. The first was to bury him under the ice, which was a fairly sort of traditional thing to do with, when ships were out in the pack for a winter. Secondly, they could have buried him on, on King William Island. And thirdly, they could have kept him in the ship hoping to take the body home for proper burial in England. So what I, I think probably happened was they would have brought it up from the hold or wherever it had been stowed and put it in the great cabin at the stern of the ship. They might even have taken the body out of the coffin and put it in the bunk. I believe they buried Franklin on King William Island and they didn't bury him, they put him in a vault like storing it safe, like it's waiting to be brought back to England. Um, it's, it's still waiting, like, that's my belief. The most interesting aspect of the whole Franklin business is the mystery, the enduring mystery of it. The fact that so many theories can be put forward and none of them can ever be exactly right. It may be that there's a grain of truth in all of them. But as for the final truth, I don't think we'll ever know. The truth rests with them, those up there who went on that expedition and died, and the truth died with them. Our week with the explorers continues tomorrow at nine with biography of another man who saw more than his fair share of ice, Sir Ernest Shackleton. Mm -hmm.